This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. On this show, we invite app industry professionals to cover various topics. And we promise to do our best to keep it both insightful, but brief. If you haven't subscribed to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or other podcast platforms where we can find us, I strongly encourage you to do that. Once you subscribe, you will be getting episodes of this show on your device as soon as it's available. In this episode, we have Gilad Bichar, CEO and founder at Maburst. Gilad, welcome to the Bien Savales podcast. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Awesome. Thank you for coming. Okay, so... One of the topics that has been permeating this podcast over the years is mobile app growth. And in general, year after year, conference after conference, countless webinars, white papers, and podcasts have been dedicated to this topic. And it's all for a good reason. If your app user base doesn't grow, you cannot sustain a business that it will be growing. Um, and because the app landscape has been changing, you always needs to be in the know of what works and what doesn't. And this is exactly what we're going to be covering on this episode with Gilad. But first, Gilad, let's kick off this episode um, with talking about you. Please tell us about your background in tech. Um, of course. So I study um, computer science in high school um, and I got into marketing roles uh, right after the army. I was in the army, Israeli army for five years. I finished there as a company commander uh, in the officer's training school. Uh, and from there, I actually went to work just like anyone else. So I started in a social media um, kind of manager type of a role from there, become kind of a head of social um, and mobile media for a bigger company. From there, became a VP media of an agency and then a CEO of a media company. Uh, all the way to a CMO in a startup. So I kind of seen each and every one of those size of the business. Uh, if you're thinking about how, what it is to be an advertiser, what it is to be a publisher, what it is to be a media company, an agency, I kind of seen each and every side of the business. Uh, I was also a mobile, uh, a mobile uh, expert in Microsoft Accelerator. So any company that raised capital from Microsoft, uh, I, I kind of held them for like almost five years to help out um, to do the mobile on the best possible way. Uh, and also uh, led, kind of leading the Tel Aviv University um, uh, courses of mobile marketing and social media marketing. So I was involved in the industry for uh, almost 10 years, uh, uh, basically going through different type of, uh, of, of roles. Um, and when I when I opened Mobers, basically it was something that was kind of saying, okay, I've done enough for many, many other companies mm -hmm. and many other entities, and I wanted to do uh, my own thing. Um, and that's kind of how I got into the into the mobile side of things of, of being a consultant and, and basically helping to transition it into a company and kind of a full scale type of a mobile marketing agency. Anything memorable from those days from all that those exper different experiences, something that stuck with you more than others? Um, so I think that any time that I met with an entrepreneur and they had this, uh, you know, they, they had this light and this type of, of crazy energy to change the world and doing something spectacular, and some of them were brilliant entrepreneurs that had crazy type of technologies of AR and AI, like things that can help you to, um, uh, uh, from so many different niches, like help you to do things that, that at the time sounds insane. Um, and I think that every time that I work with, with entrepreneurs and, and, and working with like C-level executives and helping them to, like I, I see the problem and I see that the technology that they brought in order to try to solve that problem, but then how to engage it with customers how to, at the end of the day, um, you see like a, a fantastic product, but 85% of the users are not finishing the registration flow or not really getting to the aha moment of when you're actually delighting the user with a good experience. Um, and so many that are kind of um, uh, getting in the weeds of, of technical things and technical things I'm talking about making the user do Facebook Connect getting the user to share their location with you and their uh, um, the registration of, of eight or seven different steps of giving me the permission to do this and that and that and now connect this and that and, and all of that like the user is asking themselves like what's what's in it for me why would I do all of those steps 
And as long as you can't really justify that value, so many uh, 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 fantastic products and really genius ideas that are just dropping there because the, the onboarding experience is not as smooth as it can be, or the, the, the value proposition of what's in it for the user, how to celebrate the value in front of the user. So they will understand, okay, I need to walk hard for you in the next two minutes to open an account, but mm -hmm. this is what I have on the other side. And this is why I need to be excited. And actually, I want to do that. It's not like you are making me do that. And, and flipping that is like, it's a common thread that was with each and every one of those engagements on how to simplify the user onboarding to, to delight them very early on in the, in the process to get them excited about continuing this flow and then obviously getting the aha moment of, oh, wow, this is a product I really do need to start using every single day or every week or again, depending on the, uh, on the, on the product niche itself. But I feel like that's a very common thread for all of the different thousands of thousands of, of, of entrepreneurs and, and, and companies that I've met in the past probably 15 years we're all having kind of very similar thread of, of challenges that they need help of solving in a very data-driven way of how to not lose 10% over here, another 7% over there, another 19% over this step. And at the end of the day, you're only getting 60% of the value of your marketing campaign or anything on that, on that side. I think that this is a really common thread to tiny companies all the way to, you know, working with the Googles of the world and the Samsungs of the world where, the, the, you know, their, their funnel is much more optimized by still like focusing on two or three different steps on that funnel can still get you 39% improvement on, on return of investment. Right. So I see, I see. So uh, the most, uh, the biggest, the biggest challenge was to marry these crazy ideas they have in their heads with the actual demand of people who will be using products based on those crazy ideas because people for the most part they conceive those ideas thinking about themselves what will work for me what i believe to be cool and great and your uh, goal your mission was to actually land that plane that idea to actual demand okay this is great for you it's awesome now let's see if that product will work for actual users uh, on scale my next question would be what does your company do today what do you guys do for your clients? Amazing. So basically, we're we're trying to be one stop shop for all of our, all of the mobile marketing challenges as part of this process, which means helping with the strategy, with benchmark reports, and seeing what works, what didn't work for their biggest competitors. Going back in time of actually seeing what they've tested, how they tested, so you won't really need to start from scratch. And then we are going to the creative side of things, creating all of the creative deliverables, whether it's uh, static ads, creative um, uh, video ads, or anything that need to be uh, solved in the, in the storytelling part of what's in it for the user. And then going into the media, buying media on ad networks, RTBs, exchanges, social, search, um, influencers, you name it, um, on all of the different media channels that you can think of. Um, uh, we have another uh, theme, which is the organic theme, which is kind of focusing on the upsell optimization, conversion optimization, localizations, and all of those things to boost the organic side of things. And we have uh, our development team that is kind of creating uh, everything that needed from uh, uh, the apps themselves, the websites, anything related with the, uh, the, the, the product consulting even of, of many, many different parts of the, the, the onboarding flow and things of that nature, push notification strategy and kind of managing the entire life cycle. So basically we, we can bring kind of anything that is related from the development side all the way to the creative and marketing and basically measuring the results of each and every one of those steps. So we have um, five main departments uh, and each and every one of those departments is kind of taking care of a different part of the user journey from impression to click to download cost per registered mm -hmm. user loyal user and all the way to paying user um so we have kind of five different offerings uh, from those five different offerings we have 25 business lines of service um so on on each and every one of those things we have many 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 different types of of, of potential collaborations with the, with the client, really depending on what they need to do in an outsource mode or with an agency or what they have uh, the scale to do in-house. And then how do we basically enhance their capabilities and helping them to cross to the next level and helping them to solve and troubleshoot a lot of different challenges. Even if they have the development in-house, a lot of times they need a consultant to give them the, the, like the, the areas of where to be focusing on. Even if they are doing some of the media buying in-house, a lot of times they need an audit and a fresh eye to look on, 
on their campaigns and kind of giving them uh, the guidelines. A lot of times looking on the creative side and basically providing them the creative uh, um, uh, kind of best practices in the first three to six seconds, what needs to be appearing on those ads so you have a higher conversion rate and things of this nature all the way to the absolute optimization that a lot of times they're doing that in-house, but they need localization. They need now to do that in 10 languages. They don't have the ability to do the 10 languages in-house right. every single month. So they're focusing on English US, for example, but the rest is being done with an agency. So with each and every one of those uh, service lines, we have a lot of different offerings in order to help troubleshoot mobile marketing challenges, basically. So the whole spectrum of app marketing services you can think of, uh, like anything you can think of app marketing you, you need for your company, you guys covered. I think that that's kind of what we what we bring to the to the market from from day one. Like the company was initiated like ten years ago, and I think that the missing two pieces that I had when I was on other agencies were the strategy side and the uh, product uh, uh, development side, which means. It's not necessarily that we need to develop your app, but if we know how to get and bridge that gap from a user that downloads to the, the first time registered user, that's a big, big win. And that's a piece that a lot of agencies do not cover because it's not sexy. It's not, it's not a lot yeah. of media related. It's usually small budgets, consulting by the hour. It's not- And it's harder. Bad. Exactly. It's <laughs> harder, but, but that usually unleashes the potential of the app that helps us later on that the media will be so much more effective. And because of it, to actually scale with the client very significantly. Of course, because when the app marketing is involved in the very first step, it's it's always easier later to market that product as opposed to you just being given the app that it was developed and you need to suggest a bunch of things that need to be changed and it's going to take more time, it's less efficient. So people are just spending, wasting their time. Now, um, I mentioned in the beginning that you know app marketing, uh, app industry, it's not static. Many things are changing. Uh, if you think about what changed for the last 10 years, it's, a lot of things have changed. So can you uh, talk about how mobile app marketing landscape has evolved over the past few years? What are the most significant changes you've seen? And how has Maburst adapted to all these changes? Of course, um, so I think that the, one of the biggest changes was the privacy uh, changes of Apple um, and basically removing the ability to target in the same in the same way and, and tagging users in the same way. And I think that that's uh, probably brought us kind of the biggest opportunity because we were we were focusing on on the tracking side and the BI and kind of configuring kind of what brings the best value. Um, for years uh, before it happened. And, and basically we started practicing all of those changes um, with, the, with the privacy settings of, of, of Apple probably around seven months before it happened. So we already had so many best practices of what works, what doesn't work, where you have access to the data, where you don't have that anymore. And when it happened, I feel like we got a massive surge of businesses coming up to us saying, well, our digital agency till now, we're dealing with all of those things. All of our campaigns are currently failing. What we saw before on Facebook, for example, that was working fantastic for us, doesn't work anymore. And we need someone to take uh, to take and, and basically rebuild the entire campaign strategy and things of that nature. Um, and I feel like that change um, uh, um, was hurting a lot of lot of companies in our niche, in our industry. And, and I think that we actually got a very positive surge of like a lot of companies that were looking for their mobile expertise and not just a digital agency. That, yeah, I can do mobile, I can do web, not a problem. Like I, I got you covered. Yeah. And it wasn't good enough uh, uh, after after those changes. So for us, we got a very massive wave of, of new leads. Uh, last year, I think that we finished last year with 6,300 leads coming up to our site and basically want to work with us. Now, we can't support 6,300 businesses. We only onboarded 54 new accounts. Um, and, and, and those accounts, obviously, the ones that we chose to onboard because we feel like it was a fantastic fit. Um, so we are saying more no to companies who want to work with us uh, than yes, because we really want to bet them that they will be a really valuable client for us. Um, so for, for us, those changes were very, very dramatic. And I think that uh, it actually brought us to a much better place in, in, in the marketplace of, of agencies and in the, in the marketplace of, of mobile specialists. Uh, we, we kind of broaden our services beyond just mobile to also uh, move digital um, uh, kind of, uh, of uh, a bigger view when we've done two acquisitions in 2019 and in 2022, where we bought a development house and when we bought a, a creative studio that was dealing with uh, web design and, um, and uh, uh, video production. 
but I think that we always, uh, uh, we will always remain kind of a mobile first solution. So the expertise that we gathered through the mobile side uh, is kind of what sets us apart from, from the herd. And I think that this is kind of helping us to maintain our, uh, our branding of, of basically doing mobile right and, and helping clients really get the maximum value that they can out of their products. So I guess the lesson to learn from your experience is that always think strategically, uh, understand that certain things you're not in the power to change. You cannot say Apple do not uh, deprecate IDFA, uh, do not, uh, you know, um, kind of a moving the scale towards privacy. Um, now, what are the key strategies that you believe are essential for successful growth marketing of mobile apps today? Could you share a case study where your strategies were uh, effectively applied? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I think that um, from from the get go, uh, absolute optimization was always pretty big on 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 app growth. Um, and when you're thinking about absolute optimization, you think about how users might find the app. Um, and the app optimization, I think that became much more sophisticated in the past few years, where you have the ability to impact users with so many different gateways to the app. So it's no, no longer uh, five screenshots, you're telling the story and that's it. Like no, you have, mm -hmm. yeah, you have 35 different gateways in the app store on the, on iOS and 50 different gateways, um, on custom product pages on, on Android. So you really can custom made each and every step of the users. To, uh, from a specific ad to the right storytelling of it in the App Store, and from there getting them to the right experiencing within within the app itself. And I think that App Store optimization and CLO and conversion optimization are really really crucial parts of besides obviously media and influencer marketing and all of the buzzwords around um, uh, you know influencer content and UGC yeah. content and things of that nature. And I think that App Store optimization and conversion optimization can can really pose a massive massive uh, impact on on clients. Uh, we held upside, for example, um, within less than six months to be able to pr uh, produce $16 million worth of value using upsell optimization and conversion optimization. Um, and the way to do that was just like optimizing the screenshots, optimizing the preview video. And basically, they had very, very large uh, marketing budget year over year. Um, and they spent on, on, on many, 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 like maximizing whatever you can think of um, uh, with the eight figure uh, budget every single year on the marketing side that they were doing in house. And we, we asked them a really simple question, like what happens, what if you can actually save around 20% on the cost per acquisition on all of your channels? Uh, how big that impact can be. And, and basically, uh, when we crafted all of those uh, uh, plans for the AU testing, uh, we, we really try to understand what's in it for the user. Why would they be so excited to download your, your specific app? Um, and then it started to do a very meticulous ABC testings of many, many, many different reasons about what will get users excited. Uh, and then what happens when you're adding the preview video and showing how it looks like from the inside and creating obviously different versions for iOS, different versions on Android, portrait, landscape mode, testing all of the different variants. And at the end of the day, within less than six months, uh, bringing them $16 million of, 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 of value that if, if you're thinking about about the, the the cost of doing all of those tests, we're talking about the, let's say the hundreds of thousands, if I'm really exaggerating, and then getting that type of, of, of improvement of almost 20% lower cost per, per download, it's a massive, massive impact. And I think that using all of the the capabilities that Apple and Google possess in front of you. And a lot of times, you know, people are just lazy. They say, yeah, okay, I have sets of screenshots. I have one set there. I will optimize it once a year and that will be enough. But then if you're thinking about the experience from each and every one of the sources and the main keywords that you're going after and the main audiences that you want to impact and creating them a much more custom made flow from impression to getting to the app store presence and seeing exactly what their pain point was that you are solving their pain points and then getting them in a smoother way into the store uh, all the way to, to downloading the app. That's something that really uh, can revolutionize any kind of marketing campaign. And I think that that's an amazing uh, opportunity for anyone who's a growth marketeer in the mobile marketing space. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, um... Your observation about ASO is uh, particularly uh, familiar to me because over the years, the um, App Store optimization as a service evolved that much, but many people still perceive it just, uh, you know, picking up a bunch of keywords that it will work for your app and drive traffic. But this is a very decisive. Um, it, it, it's, 
uh, you're you're being deceived thinking that it is so it's simple. Uh, it is not. If you're trying to achieve the impact you're just describing, it takes a lot of work. And for people who are uh, heavily involved in development, uh, writing code, creating a right uh, design, uh, going through a um, beta testing, uh, you know, fighting with every bug in the app, they may perceive as so as a part of the app marketing as something easy, easy done, and forget and forget about it. That's that's the problem. So uh, and yeah, uh, the introduction of uh, extra pages uh, for both the app stores create a great opportunity for a developer. But at the same time, they need to actually take advantage of that opportunity. If for doing that, they need help. They need guys like you who can actually do this job, having a previous experience, knowing what works, what doesn't work, and actually having a real perception of how it needs to be done, not just peripheral or superficial knowledge of, oh, I wrote all those papers to just, um, that's, be, uh, that's pretty easy, just piece of cake. Um, what are some of the common challenges uh, your clients uh, face in mobile app growth? And how does mobile Mobburst help overcome those challenges? Could you give us an example of a difficult campaign and how your team navigated it? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think that when Mobburst is stepping in, we're trying to think about it very strategically. Like uh, most of the agencies will tell you, give me the media budget. We will just try to optimize it and see where you, we can get you uh, the, the kind of the lowest cost per whatever action that you're looking to get. Um, but then a lot of times some, some something in the funnel is broken, which means something in the funnel doesn't work. You're trying to fill out a bucket of users and you have so many leaks on so many different places. Um, so I think that a lot of times coming back to the drawing board and saying, well, wait a minute, the conversion from click to download is X. And then the conversion from uh, download to registered user, we have there another very large gap. And then from there, getting them to loyal users and paying users, we see the gaps uh, all the time. So we can benchmark them and see where we see the biggest opportunity for improvement. Uh, and what would happen if instead of converting 10% to users that are starting to uh, trial, for example, for a subscription app, what happens if we will be able to get it to 20%? How, how big the impact would be? Um, and for those things, a lot of time you need to be brave because you need to start, like if you're thinking about it from the, 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 uh, the up size, um, the, the, on the up, the up uh, approach is like you're working with a marketeer and that marketeer a lot of times is not even in, in charge of the product itself. Like they have marketing division and they have product division yeah. and it's not under my control. And like, yeah, I got the app. This is the, uh, the, the app. This is how it works. I'm in charge of marketing. Don't don't get away to the marketing, like from the marketing side to the product, because at the end of the day, we can step on many different toes. And, and at the end of the day, it's not under my responsibility. But breaching those gaps and actually getting the harder discussion with the product uh, uh, team there and, and starting to say, you know what, those changes can change and revolutionize the entire marketing funnel. And we need to iterate them. We need to A-B test them as well and not just yeah, we can get you 10% better than what the previous uh, uh, company has done for you on the uh, cost per, per media, but it will not change the cost per subscri subscriber by 50% like you want and like you aspire to get. Uh, and if we want to change that side, we need to optimize two things. A, the monetization, like how you're actually positioning what's in it for the user to subscribe. And the second part is the onboarding. If we know that now 60% of the users are not registering, you don't even have their emails, you don't have any way of communicating with them, you don't have the permission to send them push notification. So there is no way to get them back where they abandoned and continue the flow. So for those things, we need to go deeper into the product side and actually change a different flow within those within those um, uh, elements. So we will be able to impact where the biggest problem is. The problem is not from impression to click to download. The problem is from download to activation. Um, and a lot of times bridging that gap, having that harder discussion with multiple teams in the in the client side like a lot of time you need the marketing and you need the branding and you need the development and you need the product team and in large organizations it could be 15 people on the call just to move something simple on when you're popping up that pop-up of saying do you allow this app to send notification yes allow or don't allow this simple thing that if it's triggered too early if it's triggered without the user knows what they're about to uh, get uh, uh, in favor of that, like why they, it, it's actually their incentive to to get push notification. 
um, it's very, very different. So a lot of times we need to get much deeper into the mold of, of our clients and helping them to have the discussions that sometimes are not very pleasant because the product team always think about the, the, the best features and the newest uh, technologies that they can implement and, and new algorithms that they want. And the problem is not there. The problem is that 95% of the users are not even experiencing the aha moment that the basic product is getting because no one gets to those features so adding more features on top of that will not help. Like it's it's kind of solving a different different uh, challenge. So um, uh, iterating on the monetization with the trial, without the trial, what are the cost structure of the trial, um, and things related to um, the onboarding experience of the product. Those are things that we are helping a lot of different clients, even though that they don't, they are not even aware that they have a problem. They don't have a way to benchmark themselves. Like this is how I got into into this company. I have six percent of the users that are actually paying. Ninety four percent of the users that are not paying. That's how it is. That's how it will always be. Let's try to get the the the, the first part of the funnel optimized. And and they're leaving a huge opportunity of getting from six percent to nine percent. And how big of an impact if you can get fifty percent more of users that are paying you every single year and for each and every dollar that you spend. So those are the type of the harder discussions, the harder challenges that a lot of our clients are facing. And uh, every time that we are managing to cross the, the, the road from marketing to product and helping with the entire uh, side of, of like how to strategically help that company growing, we see like a, a double digit growth uh, during this year. If not, sometimes it's even more than that. Uh, depending on their budget and depending on kind of the scale that they are bringing with them. This is Greg uh, Gilad. Um, I don't think people really appreciate uh, the job that guys uh, in your company do uh, because you're actually helping to sell a product on a big scale. Th th think about how uh, well it can interact with a client when you're selling something in person, if you're selling a car. Uh, you always see like what you need to do. You're interacting with that person at the end of the deal, he is driving away and the money is in your, in your hands, uh, figuratively speaking. Uh, with the mobile app, just like you said, there are so many occasions, so many chances for people to drop out. You never had a chance to interact with them in person. You can only have all those tools, the right tools to use to persuade that person to continue to use the app, to see the value, to become the loyal users. and. And when it comes to subscription apps, to pay that subscription every month. It's a hard work. You're doing this job for tens of thousands of users for one product. And every time you only have those tools without uh, in-person interaction to convince that person to continue to use your product. It's a hard job. Now, um, obviously, um, the answer in my mind that, uh, that will come when I hear this question is obvious, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How has the advancement in technology influenced the approach to app marketing? Are there particular technologies and tools that have transformed the way you market apps? I know AI just pops up in my mind immediately, but what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that AI is is a massive uh, improvement and, and advancement, and that's something that will impact uh, the world for, for now and always. But I think that... Um, the, the ability to be data driven and seeing what works and what doesn't work, which means at the end of the day, there are users, you're trying to bridge your message to the user and getting them to a very positive experience about whatever you're trying to sell. That's the, you know, that that's the basic of it. Um, and I think that being data driven and understanding which customers to approach with which type of messaging that will resonate with them and will get them to one step closer to the action that you want them to take. That's, that's the key element that is, that with all of the tech technology advancements and with all of the new tools that are available and all of the beta programs of TikTok and Meta and Google with uh, uh, you know all of the crazy algorithms, the machine learning that, that, that touches the users and understand who is going to be the most relevant to serve that ad with. At the end of the day, it's a fight of um, of data driven understanding your your users' core behavior, like what's in it for them, and then how you draft the right ads to to make them. Uh, you know, excited about what it is that you're offering. I think that the, the more is, is the kind of the, the industry, you know, continues to, to evolve uh, and you have more automated campaigns, whether it's with Google, whether it's Meta, uh, that are giving you the, the universal campaign and things of that nature that making the life of marketeers much easier. 
the, the only playground that you still have is the creative, and then which creative will be de de developed and, and how that will be uh, in front of the, co the, the consumer, and if that's something that we manage to get them excited about your offering. Um, so I think that, uh, yes, AI will play a massive uh, part of it. I think that more and more sophisticated tools that will come and, and make our lives a bit, e a bit easier on the bidding strategies and on the targeting uh, sides and, and trying to help us to unveil more potential. But at the same time, we need to be very mindful about what each and every uh, vertical, each and every micro segments of users need in our product. And then how do we celebrate that in a way that will get them excited to, to come in and give it, give it a shot at the end of the day. And I think that that will always be kind of the big uh, part of the marketeers that with all of the craziest technology that you can think of, understanding the user, understanding the user behavior, understanding what they are dropping off, what type of messaging will actually get them to have a one step closer to what you're doing. Those are the things that will be kind of, of, of giving the extra mile for, for the data-driven approach and making sure that we are looking into each and every step of the funnel in order to really convert them to the action that we want them to take. So don't, uh, don't drop the focus on your major uh, goal in your business. Do not be distracted with any fancy tech. Always ask a question, does this tech help me to achieve my goal, to understand better my users or not? And what is the right use case? How can I take advantage of that tech? What it would be just to, you know, waste your money and where I should actually invest more because it does make sense. Now, for marketers who are just starting out in mobile app growth, uh, what advice would you offer them? Are there common pitfalls they should avoid or best practices they should follow to achieve success? Uh, great question. Um, so I think that um, for, for kind of someone who's starting in the mobile marketing uh, niche, I think that um, a, an area that can bring you great growth is an area that is a bit more tedious, but always uh, we always see amazing success for that is localizations. Um, and when you're thinking about localization, like thinking about localizing the app, whoa, wait a minute, I don't know German, I have no idea how French, it's the right to left, left to right, Arabic, Hebrew, like so many languages, so many things, who, who wants to deal with that? And because of that exact approach, most of the marketeers and most of the app growth experts are not really doing it because it's a lot of work. Uh, but at the end of the day, to get another 20 downloads every single day, because you localize it to Portuguese. And then another 15 downloads every single day from, I don't know, even Iraq or from uh, French or uh, another 17 downloads that you're getting every single day from Romania. All of those things are piling up to pretty big pile of new users every single month. And doing that in the App Store helps you to basically uh, uh, be there where a lot of your competitors are lazier than you and they haven't done that. And because of it, when they're looking for your type of solution, it's not as competitive as English is uh, because everyone is doing, you know, optimizing the hell out of the English language, um, but uh, lacking of, of, of that additional step of, of, of localization and culturalization for different languages. So I think that even though that is a big headache, so to speak, the opportunity there can be very, very significant. We have companies where we help them to uh, get anywhere from, let's say, 200 downloads that they had every single uh, um, uh, day organically, all the way to 2,600 downloads every single day organically just by doing those localizations. So the, the number and, and the, the, the opportunity there is, is really massive. Yes, it's a lot of headache. Uh, working with translators and, and not just using Google Translate, again, doing the extra mile and doing the keyword research on those languages and seeing which type of keywords have more traffic. It's not hard work, it's a lot of work. And I think that if you are doing it, the opportunity for you to get much more uh, downloads every single day, instead of paying by the user on, on media side, you can get them organically. I think that that poses still a big, big opportunity for, uh, for someone who's starting mobile app growth from, from the get-go, especially if you have a low budget. That's something that uh, can definitely uh, drive really nice growth uh, without having to pay too heavily on, uh, on, on the marketing, like on cost per download for each and every one of the campaigns. This is great, Gulat. So on those markets, uh, you may have the same demand or even more demand than in your own market, but at the same time, the number of competitors can be less because if we're talking about the, the smaller country where it doesn't have the, you know, the um, sophistication and the choices of technologies that Silicon Valley provides you, 
you are competing actually in the smaller pool of competitors, you have a better chance to get a leg up on, on th those markets if you are willing to spend extra effort to adapt to um, localize your app to those markets. Okay. So um, I think uh, you have something to say about the next question because obviously you have, have a number of years of running um, a burst and uh, all those previous years of experience. Looking at app marketing as a whole, what would you like to change about it the most? Um, wow, it's a it's a it's a hard question. I think that uh, changing something in the industry, I think that the, the the one of the the challenges that we face is like a lot of different um, a lot of people that think that hey, you know what, we'll just uh, invest a little bit in influencer, for example. We're getting millions of millions of views. The app will go viral, and and you know what, and and that's it. Like um, the, it's like uh, overnight we have millions of downloads, and it's all going to be uh, uh, great. I think that a lot of companies are selling those dreams that hey, let's use influencer marketing because this is where you have the ability to shine big time. Uh, and and I think that um, it's not it's not really fraud, but I feel like it's it's setting the right expectations with clients is extremely important. And most of the campaigns that you will do will not become viral. Most of the apps that will go and launch in the, in the, app, in the app world will not get viral. Uh, if someone, if you're thinking about what is a viral product and actually something that expands really big, it means that each and every user tells more than, on average, more than one more user to get it to spread. Uh, and most apps do not do that. No matter how amazing the experience is, the most of them are not really doing it. So I think that using of, of influencer marketing and setting expectation around influencer marketing, we get so many companies that reach out to us saying, hey, you know what, we tested two different companies and your app didn't go viral. And I said like, your app is, is, is a dating app. Like if it's a dating app, it will not go viral because it, a lot of people are ashamed of using uh, 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 those apps, not because it's something that you need to be ashamed of, but you don't want to tell your friends that you couldn't meet the person uh, uh, in, in real life. So you need a, a, a dating app for that. Like even if you, it's the most valuable product on earth, you not necessarily want to share it with other uh, with other men. For example, if it's a man, they don't want more competitors, so to speak. And if it's uh, on the female side, it's something that you might be a bit embarrassed of, of admitting. Again, it's much more common these days, but I feel like the, the, the majority of the apps cannot go viral. And I feel like a lot of uh, salespeople on the agency side are promising the world and saying, yeah, you know what, when we are doing that, they're showing one specific case study of insane results and saying, this is what you can expect. And then the companies are setting those expectations with their board, with their management, come to the market and then fail miserably compared to where they set the expectation. Um, and then when they're coming to the next agency and looking for a replacement, and then someone actually is telling them the truth and saying, well, guys, I don't know why this is where the expectation, but it's not very realistic. This is what you can actually expect out of that. And then they're really uh, kind of saying, well, if that's the case, we might need to pivot. We might need to actually uh, product, uh, produce another product or come to a different uh, monetization strategy because that cannot work in our mathematical equation of, of performer, which is making profitable um, out of that. So I think that a lot of uh, uh, mobile marketeers are still promising the world, especially when it comes to influencer marketing, where they're saying millions of viewers, what would happen if you have millions of millions of views on social? And usually it doesn't mean much. Um, so I think that that's something that I'm, I'm a bit more like, I, I have so many discussions, hard discussions with the, with the management of companies that are saying, but this is not what we were told and saying, I'm sorry about that, but it's, it's, it's the reality that that's the benchmark. This is how it works. It's not like what I want it to be. I would love it. I will open the, the champagne bottle together with you if we will be able to reach that, but it's not what you should expect because it's, it's not very likely that it will happen. I'm totally with you, Galad. People do not realize that as great as uh, influencer marketing is, the second part of the equation people are not aware of, it's not for everything. People cannot be excited with many things for what are many reasons, some of those you've just raised. And uh, it's, a, it's a great tool in the toolbox, but it has very specific uh, kind of uh, usage. It may work in specific cases, but it's not something you would recommend to many people when you just want to sell them an extra service and you want to just, you know, blind them with a big shiny numbers. Yeah, I thought totally uh, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I had a client reaching out to me this week and they wanted to do 
uh, and that's a very big misconception in the in the uh, area of, of influencer marketing. They wanted to do a massive campaign of influencer marketing, but they are only servicing in one specific state, which means they wanted to focus only in New York, hopefully on New York City more than in, even in New York. And I show them, like I have access to 5.8 million profiles of influencers uh, in, in the US, and I'm subscribed to so many different tools. We're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that level of, of data. And I show them that the most uh, advanced type of influencer, even if that influencer has 6 million followers, if you're only trying to, to target people around New York, most of the influencers, even if 95% if of the followers are from the US, it will be scattered 2% to New York, 3% to uh, San Francisco, 3% 3, uh, 3 to uh, California, um, uh, or let's say 2% uh, uh, for, for Florida. So if you have 50 states and, and someone is trying to promote something very, very locally, it's the wrong usage of platform. Like majority of the budget that you're going to be spending on, on collaborating with this type of influencer will be wasted on people outside of New York. So if you want to use that, not a problem. Create a UGC ad, create an ad, and then post it and using the ad platforms to only target people around New York. That, that's much smarter. But they're so fond of the, the idea that, no, my CEO said that we need to use influencers. And now, yes, you can pay that influencer $6,000, but 95% of the audience is outside of New York. So why using this platform? It's the wrong platform, the wrong toolbox to use for that specific uh, thing. And, and it's, it's not a common, it's not a common uh, knowledge in, in the industry. So someone decided that, hey, a friend of mine or a colleague actually used influencer marketing and it was skyrocketing their business. And it's not going to be working for you if you need to be very, very uh, specific, very local on the state level or something on that side, or it's, uh, definitely not on the city level. Um, so it's, it's something that I feel like it's, it's a big misconception and, and setting the right expectations based on data and seeing what the data dictates where, how many of the followers, male and females, and, and what everything you can know about an influencer before we've been engaging with them to understand where the audience is from. So you would make sure that this is the right fit for the campaign. Gotcha, Yohan. That's, that's amazing. All right. So we've just covered the topic on the table. This is the first part of the show. And we transition into the second one. Every time I have a new guest, um, I always take this chance to ask a few quick questions, thus helping people who are listening to us uh, know my guests a little bit better. Here we go. So rapid fire questions. Uh, what smartphone do you have now? Uh, have you been switching between these two giants, Android, iOS, or just one side all the time? It's a great question. I think that I started with iOS and Android. I had both of them in, in my pocket till 2015. I, I felt like I really need to master both operation systems. But from 2015, I became a bit lazier and basically only work with the iPhone today. So I have the iPhone 15 uh, uh, Pro Max, um, the bigger screen. And, and I think that it's a spectacular phone. Um, and I can't really go back to Android at this stage. Got you. All right. All right. So... Uh... Back in time, before the era of smartphones, do you remember your first mobile phone? Yeah, uh, I think it was the Motorola, those clap phones um, that the uh, uh, Motorola Mirrors i76, I think it was, um, that was very, very uh, advanced at the time with the push to talk feature that I really liked. Um, but that was a, a very, very different era, I guess. Oh, yeah, back in the day, Motorola, the glorious days of that company. Uh, all right. Back to present. So imagine you've left your home for whatever reason, you left your iPhone sitting at home. What is the most missing feature for you at that point? I think that it would be all the camera or WhatsApp. I think that those are the, probably the two tools that I'm using the most, WhatsApp for communication with the world, family and everything. I'm living basically in the US now, so my family is, is in Israel. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, this is kind of my main communication tool and also the camera because I have three kids and I'm picturing them every single opportunity that I have. Two beautiful girls and one really awesome son. And at the end of the day, I definitely want to have the memories of so many different moments outside of work when I have the time I want to be there with them and I want to also treasure those moments. Exactly. That's the best case for your camera. Absolutely. Uh, as great as uh, iPhone 15 Pro is, um, do you have a moment when you think about any technology, hardware, software, or both? It would be great to have on your phone. Not particularly something fancy and trendy, but if you think about like your personal use, what would make that device a better tool for you? 
Um, so again, thinking about the kids, I think that one of the things that weren't uh, uh, weren't added to the phone just yet is thermometer. So if if my kid doesn't feel well, the fact that it can also measure kind of what is there, uh, I, I don't think that it's that sophisticated. You have the thermometers that you can just scan on the forehead, and and then so I think that the, adding that to the to the massive massive amount of tools and features and 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 uh, elements that you have on your device shouldn't be that that uh, big of a deal, and it will help a lot of parents out there. Oh yeah, uh, healthcare. This is the next industry to disrupt for sure, and thermometer will have for, for sure having your phone. All right, very very final question before I let you go. How can people get in touch with you and get more information about what you do? Amazing. So the easiest way is going to be uh, logging into our website www.mobers.com, um, and if you want to get in touch with me, it's g at mobers.com. That's my email. Uh, feel free to reach out. And again, I would love to help with whatever we can. Great. Go up. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Bye bye. Much. Thank you. And that was Gilad Bichar, CEO and founder of Memburst. To listen to more episodes, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. Just search for Business of Apps. You will find this easily. Remember, we release episodes on Mondays. So subscribe and you will be getting episodes of this show on your smartphone, tablet, or computer as soon as we release them. And please don't forget to leave us a review or comment on iTunes. It is highly appreciated. And all episodes will also be available on businessofapps.com. Thank you for listening. See you next week. Thank you for listening to the Business of Apps podcast. For more, head on over to businessofapps.com.